Okay, it's 11 o'clock, so let's start this conference with our first session. Welcome, everyone, to my talk about Kotlin and Project Loom. My name is Urs Peter. Quite a few gray, gray hair, so I dare to call myself a senior software engineer. During my daily job, I try to be as much as possible with my hands in the dirt in the role of team lead and solution architect. I'm also a trainer at the Xeve Academy, where I'm the author of a variety of trainings, mostly about Kotlin. I'm also a ChatBrain certified Kotlin trainer where I help Kotlin teams in the adoption of Kotlin throughout all their stages, beginning, intermediate, or advanced. When you look at my career, I started out with Java about 20 years ago. 10 years ago, I moved over to Scala. And since about four to five years, I'm mostly writing backend logic in Kotlin. Throughout all my career, I always had a fascination for concurrency. I went through the murky waters with low-level threading in Java, wait, notify, Java to concurrent, seen all these, moved over to Scala and had a look at uh, reactive programming tools, reactive streams, the actor framework, and in Kotlin, I mostly did uh, quite cool stuff, production stuff with coroutines. Okay, enough about me. I would like to know a little bit more about you. So who of you programs foremost in Java? Okay, so that's more than half. Who's also programming in Kotlin? Uh, a little bit less, check. Who of you is using reactive frameworks? Yeah. Who thinks this is particularly simple to use them? Okay, okay. I don't hope they're imposters. <laughs> okay, and who of you has used coroutines? Okay, quite a few. But most of you that did Kotlin also use coroutines. Excellent. That gives a good image for me. So, well, I think it's worthwhile to first look at coroutines for the ones who don't know what they are. Because once we understand coroutines, you also will understand a lot more about Loom. Because they try to achieve the same thing with slightly different means. In order to do that, we started with a very, very simple example that, well, doesn't have yet a lot to do with coroutines but we'll justify them. This example we used throughout my presentation many times in very different forms. It's quite simple, so we do two remote REST calls, as you can see here, with random avatar verify email, and then eventually we save a user in database, all using blocking calls, so GDBC or for Spring Boot users, REST template. And if you look at it, you might think, okay, this is so easy, so why should you ever learn something new, right? Well, when we put this particular code on the load, then you might know why this is not the perfect world. What I've prepared here is a Spring Boot application, which does exactly what you see in the slides. So you have these two remote calls we're doing here. On top of that, what it can do is you can introduce an artificial delay with a request parameter. So calling these two REST services, they will uh, delay the response for the amount that is given here. What I did on top of that too is to create a dramatic effect quicker than having a lot of uh, machinery need for that, I removed the total amount of threads to 20. So let's see what we are getting then. This is when we do a normal REST call. What I also print is the thread that created this particular response. Then let's see how long this takes with an artificial delay of 200 milliseconds. Well, it takes 400 milliseconds, because you do two REST calls, each of them has a delay of 200 milliseconds, adds up to 400, with some overhead for the GDBC call, right? So, no matter how many times we do this, it's always about 400 milliseconds. Now, the interesting thing happens, we put the thing under load. And instead of having a delay of 200 milliseconds, we now take a delay of two seconds, which is longer, right? We do this with 100 concurrent requests that emit a total amount of 110 requests. So let's see what is happening here. So we expect actually an average of four seconds, right? Because we have two seconds times two, so four seconds, this would be the ideal picture. Which, well, isn't really the case, right? So our minimum response indeed is four seconds, but the average is 18 seconds. That's just outrageous, right? How? Come. In order to understand what happened, we need to know how these architectures work. The architectures that we're using here is Tomcat, Chatty, these kind of servers, and they normally work with a thread pool. 
and each request that comes in will take one thread of the pool, and this thread will then be dedicated to handle the whole request. So whenever we do some remote calls, the thread just sits there and waits till a reply has been received. Then it does the, uh, the subsequent call till a response can be sent. What happens now if a resource becomes slow, like we mimicked without delay? Then uh, it might quite quickly happen when we have a bit load of our system that the thread pool gets exhausted. And because the thread pool gets exhausted, we cannot accept new requests, leaving our users extremely unhappy. Besides that, we cannot leverage parallelism very easily because it's a kind of sequential programming model that doesn't allow for parallelism. Okay, this is nothing new. This problem has been kind of uh, realized about 10 years ago when these reactive toolkits came along. And this would be the code rewritten with Spring Boot Reactor. Who of, know, who of you is using Spring Boot and knows a bit about Spring Boot? I guess most of you, right? Okay, check. So we've written this code, and apparently this reactive stuff should solve that problem. Let's see if that is true. So also, uh, the Spring Boot application has a, a reactive endpoint, and this is the one we're going to use now. Let's just do a, a simple request first. Then we see it's apparently handled by a reactor thread. Then we time the whole thing, again using a delay of 200 milliseconds. And what you see now, it looks a little bit better because now we have only 200 milliseconds plus a bit more. Why is that? because we can leverage parallelism. Our use case allows for parallelism, so the two remote calls we um, initiate in parallel, leading us to not 400 milliseconds, but 200 milliseconds. Now I put the thing on the load with the exact same characteristics as we had with our blocking use case. So two seconds delay, 100 recurrent requests, 110, and what you see is the picture we always would have liked to have, which is about two seconds, no matter uh, whether it's max, mean, or average. So that sounds already quite better, right? How, does the how do these artifacts work? How can they all of a sudden perform much better than our blocking model? Well, the interesting thing is that with these artifacts, we actually have less threads. We have about as many threads as, as we have cores. The difference is that these requests are not handled um, in a blocking fashion, they're handled in an asynchronous fashion. So a thread is taken off the pool, and whenever it hits an I.O. boundary, it will kind of offload the request, go back to the pool, and take on new work. Once we get a reply from our web service, then um, another thread or the same thread will be taken again off the pool and continue process till again it hits a boundary. And by uh, doing so, we fulfill our requests. What's very important here to realize is that if we use this model, we cannot use our blocking APIs. That's impossible. So you have to use non-blocking libraries. So in terms of Spring Boot, this means web client address template. In terms of database access, it means RTDBC and not GDBC, because these are all blocking. So this is a kind of limitation we have to deal with, which can have quite some consequences. Well, what happens if one of the resources becomes slow, like we mimicked with our two seconds? Then, well, not much happens, right? Because the thread pool that accepts new requests cannot be exhausted. It's not blocking. Besides that, that's what we've seen too, we now can leverage parallelism, giving us additional a boost for our architecture, rendering us happy users. So, is reactive the problem, the, the answer to all problems? Well, if it was, I think we could stop the presentation and walk out and uh, everything would be fine and dandy. At least that's what people thought about 10 years ago. Let's look at what we are dealing with when we start doing reactive programming. Well, reactive building blocks are libraries, and libraries, they impose their abstraction on our code. And with reactive libraries, these abstractions really will dominate our whole code base. All of a sudden, our code is not about domain logic anymore, it's about, foremost about monos, about flat maps, sit to finally, and so on. So the business intent of what I want to express in my code really gets tremendously blurred with those reactive abstractions. Which, by the way, also go viral in our code, because all the layers you will see these kind of constructs um, coming back. Besides that, it's quite simple to shoot yourself in the foot, and not in a unit test, but in production, when it's too late, because you got a lot of load and you made a mistake. For instance, using a blocking library, which would then have blocked one of these precious scheduler threads, which, deteriorate, which leads to a deterioration of your performance in, uh, in really uh, a meme of time. 
So we could say that reactive program, programming gets the job done. I mean, we've seen much better performance characteristics, but the accidental complexity is simply enormously large. And uh, that kind of justif or a kind of um, uh, proof that not many hands went up when I ask, is reactive programming really simple to do? It's kind of a tough, a tough nut to crack. It gets good results, but the price is just quite high. Is there a better answer? I dare to say yes, there is a pill against this, with, which is Kotlin coroutines. What are coroutines? Coroutines are basically the combination of the best of two worlds. It allows us to express our logic sequentially, like we did in our blocking case, and then the runtime would figure out the asynchrony by itself. So the asynchrony is something we do not have to care about anymore with mostly map or flat map kind of operations. In order to do this in Kotlin, what you need to have are those so-called suspend methods. Suspend methods are special methods that can only be executed by a coroutine. And they have the effect that they never block an underlying thread. This would then decode, this is how the code would look like if you used coroutine. And this code would really perform as well as um, the reactive counterpart we've seen before. Your boss understands this code, so apparently this really must be easy code to maintain for all of us. Besides that, we also now can leverage um, parallelism by using async await, kind of evident way of doing things, also a concept that is found in many languages, not only in Kotlin. Of course, you won't get this totally for free, right? So there are some things involved, in, um, involved like the suspend methods. We all see such a coroutine scope, so there is some fluff and stuff that you need to be aware of and also should be aware of to know how this works because also here you can shoot yourself in the foot to a certain degree. First of all, what are coroutines? When we look at operating systems, what you see at the lower levels, at the lowest level, we have CPU. And CPU, this is the place where the real work is taking place, right? On top of that, we have the so-called kernel threads, and these kernel threads fight for a time slice on the CPU using this so-called preemptive scheduling. You might have heard this term. Quite a complex uh, area of computer engineering. When we look at these kernel threads, what we see is that they're quite an expensive resource. We can only have about 4,000 kernel threads per, giga per gigabyte of memory. The GVM, the threads you're using, the so-called platform threads, they're one-to-one -one bound to kernel threads. So they're as expensive as kernel threads. Coroutines now a layer on top of these threads, which are very lightweight. So you can have about 2.4 million per gigabyte of memory. On the GVM, when you want to have something done, you always need a thread. Thread is the only kind of feature and building block we have to execute works. So also, coroutines eventually need to be executed by a thread. But in this case, coroutines are not bound to a thread. Just eventually the thread will use them to execute work. So let's look at the difference. Here we have a snippet that creates 100,000 threads, which then sleep for two seconds. The thread thing you see here is kind of short, Kotlin shortcut, which is a shortcut for new thread, new runnable, and then an implementation for the run method. The counterpart with coroutines would look as such, and I think it deserves a little bit more of an explanation. First of all, you cannot create coroutines as you can create threads. There is no oper nor um, constructor I can call new uh, coroutine, do your thing. No, you always need a builder to do that. And the builder we use here is run blocking, which is a special one, which you also shouldn't use in production code, only for testing purposes. Run blocking kind of bridges the thread world with the coroutine world in a blocking way, which in real rack systems you do not want. I will show you later how you can um, overcome that. Then this run blocking also gives us something we don't see yet, but it gives us some special context on which we can create new coroutines. And this is what we do here with launch. So here we launch a new coroutine, a bit like we create a new thread on top of it. So um, semantically, that's the same. Delay is actually one of the beautiful things of coroutines. This is a suspend method. And instead of blocking a coroutine, it simply suspends itself for two seconds and then will be resumed once two seconds have passed. So let's try out these snippets and see how they perform. What do you think in the first case? What do you expect? <laughs> what? 
Out of memory? Everybody agrees that? Okay. But I think it's still nice to see it, right? Seeing is believing. So this is what we, uh, what we do here. Many threads. We execute them, 100,000. I have two gigabytes of memory. How many threads can be created? 8,000, right? We said about 4,000 threads per gigabyte of memory. I have two gigabytes of memory, XMX two gigs. I get about 8,000 threads, and then the whole thing blows. This is what you get with threading, because they're so expensive. And as you might assume, the core example should be a piece of cake, because you can have 2.4 million per gigabyte of memory. And this is what happens. In a short amount of time, we've created 100,000 core teats. So this is the summary of these two snippets. Let's quickly look at these suspend functions. When you have the suspend keyword, you have a suspend function, which are just normal functions. They can have parameter return times as normal functions. The capability they gain is that they can be paused and resumed at the later stage. They also can only be executed by a coroutine, not by normal methods. So this is a constraint you have to f you're facing when you use these suspend methods. So when I have a call chain like this, source, controller, repository, client, I couldn't call from a normal method in my control a suspend method, which would be a service method. That's not possible. You get a compilation error. Because apparently, we need some context things to make this whole work. And we'll see in a minute what this exactly is. What you can do, and people do, unfortunately, is use these run blocking blocks. So then they start out with a normal method. You call run blocking, which, well, you can do. It works. But you won't get the performance out of it because you're still blocking threads. And really active systems don't block. So you can do it, but you shouldn't. The way you should do is actually start from the very beginning of your call chain with suspend. So from the right from the start, and frameworks out there, the Quarkus, the, the Spring Boots, uh, the Vertex, and so on, they all, all have means to start out with a suspend method. This is the way you should do it. You can call normal method from suspend methods. That's fine. You even can call blocking. Um, code from the spam match, but then you have to make sure that you have so-called dispatchers I.O., which is a dispatcher with an additional amount of threads so that the scheduler thread that runs these coroutines is never blocked. This is, this is exactly the same limitation like with all the reactive toolkits out there. When you want to do blocking stuff in reactive toolkits, you must ensure that you don't use the scheduler threads that runs all this um, reactive machinery. You have to have dedicated threads for that. OK, so now let's look at these builder methods. Because these builder methods reveal us the building blocks that give coroutines tremendous amount of power. And you will see that also in Project Loom, to a certain degree, they had the same problems. And they solved it similarly. That's kind of interesting to see the both what, what, what kind of choice they made and also what kind of effect this choice had. But first, we need to understand these. And we look first at the coroutine scope. What do you get without the coroutine scope? Well, then you get what you see in the threading example. If I want this first thread to terminate its work before my program exits, what I have to do is I have to join. Right? So I have to synchronize those threads uh, manually. Otherwise, it would print start to done, and the other thread would never have a chance to uh, finish its work. Besides that, thread.join also blocks another thread. So the way we, do, we achieve our result is by blocking threads, blocking resources. Now let's look at this coroutine scope, what it does. Basically, when you use run blocking, what you get is an implicit coroutine scope. And this is exactly what we need to create coroutines. So we need to have such a scope. Then we have this coroutine scope wrapper here. And what this basically gives us is a parent scope. When we then launch a coroutine, which is on this parent scope, we get a child scope. So what are these scopes good for? Well, these scopes, they monitor the completion of all the child scopes. No matter how deeply you nest your process tree, the parent is always responsible to know when all the children have been terminated. And that's why we do not have to synchronize our process manually. Simply by giving it a structure, the structure will reflect how I manage my processes. So simply by calling coroutine scope, everything in this block will be terminated before I proceed, no matter how many asynchronous processes I spawn within this particular block. And this has a fancy name, structured concurrency. Have you heard of this term? OK, a few have. Check. 
it will come back with loom definitely. That's a, a term that is used uh, heavily there too. But there is more to this coroutine scope. Say I want to kind of stop the thread I have there on the left. Well, the only way to do that is interrupt. And that's really kind of hard way of killing a thread, right? It's kill me nine, more or less. Just go away. Not, um, not very um, manageable and with a, nice, with a nice life cycle. It's really just cut the head off. With Coroutine's cancellation is very well thought of, so when I launch, what I basically get back is a so-called job, and on a job I can call cancel. And this cancel would not only cancel this particular Coroutine here, but if I would spawn other Coroutines there, it would actually cancel my whole process tree. So also there, I get propagation of cancellation the way I would expect with structured concurrency. Which in thread wouldn't work, right? If I would spawn a new thread here, this one would still run. It, it's not bound to the thread that I uh, created first. How about exceptions? Well, if I throw an exception in a thread, you might know what happens. It kind of disappears in limbo. Nobody knows that this error has happened. With structured concurrency, we also have the advantage that even so, asynchronous processes throw exceptions, they still are propagated to the parent, and the parent kind of knows that this has happened, then you can use a normal try-catch to handle those exceptions. What's also quite nice to see is that cancellation and exceptions are working nicely together. So if I launch two processes here and I throw an exception here, then also uh, all the processes within this particular co scope would be cancelled. This is the default behavior. What's very nice about this uh, stored concurrency in Kotlin is that you have very fine grade control what you want to accomplish once such a situation would occur. For instance, I could say, okay, this particular block I want to exclude from cancellation. And also there, the next thing is in that sense, infinite. Okay, so that was the coroutine scope. The other ingredient is the coroutine context, which is also plays a very important part. So what is the coroutine context? It's basically many things, it's not one thing, but probably the most important thing is that it holds the thread pool that will be used to execute the coroutines, so-called dispatchers. By default, you always get, as you can see, there is a default um, context we get, which most of the time does a good job. So let's see the thing in action. What we have here is again such a run blocking call, and what we do in these launches here is, actually in parallel, we execute some remote blocking call. If you do not want our main dispatch to be blocked, then I have to use a dispatch IO, which gives me additional threads to do its work. So then the, the, the thread that would block this remote call is a thread that is really dedicated to do that. So the event loop of my coroutines won't be um, influenced. The nice thing about this coroutine context is that they are automatically propagated. So I define it here, and when I launch new stuff, it simply inherits the context from its parent. Again, I can change it if I want it, but by default, things are inherited, which are very convenient. Well, if you look closely, we do something kind of crazy here, right? Because we use an MDC. Anybody has heard of MDCs? It's a diagnostical context. Uh, you can set some values on the thread local, and then when you lock, this value will be taken out, and then you would get this particular value locked. But hey, we are using here such a dispatch I.O., which means that the thread where we put the MDC on might not be the same in these launches, right? So we might lose the information we set there. Also there, coroutines, um, so this is basically what you get. So here, if you say order, this ID, it could still find, but here, because another thread would be used, um, the particular order ID would not be available. Also here, Coroutines came up with a nice solution to allow you to bridge thread local state with Coroutine state. And this works as such, that you can use the so-called with context with an implementation of thread context element. That's kind of interface that takes certain state from a thread local, puts it on the next, and also um, gives it back once it goes back to the pool. So by doing so, um, we can even propagate state from a particular thread local to all my processes that are spawned beneath. Okay, well, 
I would say that sounds pretty good, but how do you kind of use these coroutines with reactive libraries? Because often, mo often, mo quite a few times you have some sort of reactive library and you don't have coroutines from the core. That's quite easy, so this would be an example in Java using a reactor again from Spring Boot that returns these monos. The only thing I have to do to kind of lift this implementation to coroutines is, first, mark my method suspend, second, use one of these extension methods I uh, implement, which then simply lifts my mono into a suspend call. And by doing so, I get completely rid of this nasty mono abstraction. So from now on, it's simply express your logic sequentially instead of all these flat map, flat map, method call, method call, and so on. So by doing this, um, by using this approach, we get code which is extremely manageable, easy to read, maintain, and so on, with the exact same performance characteristics. I can show you that this is really the case. So I also have my um, a coroutines implementation in my Spring Boot application. So you see, again, a reactor thread will handle it. How long does it take? Also two, uh, 200 milliseconds. Even so, we do two remote calls because we can leverage parallelism with async await. Always about two uh, milliseconds. And if we do the performance to see how this compares to our reactor example here on top, then we see that this is uh, more or less the same. So also these 200 seconds, even a bit faster. But this really depends on how, how many times you run. You cannot say coroutines are fast. It's just the same. Okay, so let's recap. We have lightweight threads. We can write, can we write synchronous logic and execute asynchronously? Yes, we can. Are coroutines totally non-intrusive? No, they're not, right? You have to suspend calls and there are some limitations and constraints how you're gonna use them. Do we have storage concurrency? I would say yes, perfect even. And we have nice interop with reactive and async frameworks. So all in all, coroutines really give you a hassle-free way of doing concurrency. No wonder Java wants this too. And this is where Project Loom comes in. The nice thing is, because we now uh, truly this, uh, went through coroutines, we have the list to see on what we have to look when we try to explore Loom. So let's see which boxes we can tick when we go through Loom. What is Loom? Well, Loom uh, is already quite some years old, 2018 it started. And if you look at its motivation, we see that it's actually exactly the same like with coroutines. Same goal, is to use high throughput lightweight concurrency for the GVM. Loom is not one thing. Loom are three different chaps. Chap 425 is virtual threads, which will be final by the end of this year. This is a really great announcement. And they're very similar to coroutines, conceptually. Then you have the structured concurrency chap, which is separate, which is similar to coroutine scope, and the so-called scope values, which are similar to coroutine context. So what are virtual threads? Well, virtual threads are more or less the same like coroutines, they're lightweight threads. And also virtual threads eventually need to be executed with a real thread. And the way Loom addresses it is by introducing a new kind of thread, which is called the carrier threads. These threads execute virtual threads. Carrier threads you as a developer cannot access. That's kind of a black box for you. They're just doing their work. And of course, classic threads are still available. They don't uh, go away. So how does a virtual thread look like? We've seen this example before. This is the counterpart in for a virtual thread. And well, they have the same interface. So from the outside, it's still a thread. But from the inside, it's quite different. So let's um, run our example. So this would be the example we had with coroutines here on top, and this would be the example with Loom using the same code like before, but then with a virtual thread instead of a normal thread. And you might guess that now things look considerably better. Running these virtual threads, 100,000 is really a piece of cake to create them. So in both cases, easy peasy. So apparently the sleep method now behaves differently, right? It doesn't block a, th a, th a real threat, a real resource. It has the same kind of characteristic as delay, which means suspend 
and resume at a later time. So lightweight, threat, lightweight threats, yes, we can check that. How about um, writing synchronous logic that is executed asynchronously? And this is really the cool thing about Loom. I just really love that. Let's recap in coroutines. What you should do in coroutines is always use a non-blocking library. The same for reactive frameworks. Exactly the same kind of constraints um, apply. Why? Because the underlying threads should always be able to perform their work. They should never be blocked. If you use some blocking I.O., we've seen, then you have to ensure that you get a dedicated thread that does that for you, like the dispatcher's I.O. example I've showed you. Otherwise, you shoot yourself really in the foot. The cool thing with Loom is that they retrofitted the old school Java I.O. APIs, Java Util Concurrent APIs, as such that when a virtual thread calls some I.O. code, it does not block the underlying carrier thread, but simply suspend the virtual thread and wake up once you get a reply from your network or from a lock in your Java Util Concurrent. And this is really, really an awesome thing. So the carrier threads, a bit like coroutines, can always do their work. The only difference is that I cannot shoot myself in the foot because this just always happens. I cannot influence it. It does things automatically asynchronously. So the chance for errors is much, much lower. There are two uh, um, exceptions, though. Synchronized blocks and native calls st will still pin so-called carrier threads. And that's why I think many frameworks out there have, on servers have not yet embraced virtual thread fully, because there are still some synchronized blocks somewhere, and they really can deteriorate performance very quickly. So they first have to um, replace them with a decent Java tool concurrent implementation. So for me, this is the kind of best um, materialized way of a back to the future moment I've seen in my whole life. Hard to believe, right? Um, so what I did here is use a different thread pool for my Spring Boot application. So we create a virtual thread for our requests instead of normal threads. And by doing so, by using Loom, I should be able now to call the exact same code I had before, the blocking code, which then should also behave nicely on the load, right? This is what we would expect to happen. Let's see if this is the case. So I, also, I use again my uh, blocking stuff. First, the normal thread. We will see that it is now a virtual thread, right? It's not a normal thread anymore. In terms of timing, we have still our four milliseconds. We don't, do, we don't use parallelism yet, so it adds up together. And now the interesting thing comes we have 200, two seconds delay, so we expect four seconds on average, no matter how much load I'm putting on things. And this is exactly what we get here. So about four seconds on average. So the behavior is now as good as reactive, except that we don't yet use parallelism. So how, do we, how does this architecture work? When you get a request, you simply create virtual thread. Pooling is not needed anymore. Pools you only need for expensive resources. When you have expensive resources, then you need a pool, and if they're cheap, you don't need a pool. That also applies for virtual threads. Of course, there's a carrier thread that does the real work. Whenever you hit an I.O. boundary, even using blocking normal I.O., then the carrier thread would go do something else, and the virtual thread would be um, suspended. It would be resumed once you get a reply, and so on, and so on. And also here, when the resource becomes slow, well, no real carrier thread will be blocked unless it's synchronized on native call, which chances are very low. So we can always accept new requests. How about parallelism? We will see that in a minute. But in the end, we get quite happy users only because we use Loom instead of what we used before. No change needed, only just upgrade your GVM and you're done. So we can really say writing synchronous logic that it's asynchronously, that's um, a check and also in a very non-intrusive way. Whereas with core teams, we still have the limitation of these suspend methods. Now this is just, just works. So should you use mostly these thread per request type of applications, actually then you're done. Then you get a performance boost just by simply upgrading your GVM. And that's really an awesome thing. If you want to have more advanced stuff like story concurrency, um, reactive interop, Let's go further and take a look. Now it's getting a bit more speculation because these chaps, even sort of quite stable for some time, I monitor, things I monitor these things closely, it's quite stable, but still, there is an amount of speculation here. That's why I also mark them um, with, with red. 
We've seen in Kotlin, this is how you do structured concurrency, right? You have these code blocks, and you can be um, sure that all these processes within this block must have been terminated before the next block is executed. The counterpart with Project Loom looks as follows. This is the exact same code, more or less, with Loom. So what Loom does is using the so-called structure task scope in a Travis finally block. And then you have the scope, and based on the scope, you can spawn new processes. You then shouldn't forget to call join, shouldn't maybe forget to call throw if failed. You get all kind of weird side effects. But this is more or less how you achieve structured currency with, um, with Loom. You also can rely on async await. And this scope.fork, what it returns, is a future an old 1.7 future, the evil future, which was kind of really banned from, uh, from site quite a, a few years ago, which had this nasty blocking.get method. But now, because a virtual thread doesn't block, you can call .get, which will behave exactly the same like suspend methods. It will suspend the future, and once you get a result, the virtual thread that was calling it would be resumed. So all of a sudden, these old-fashioned futures is hip again. How about uh, cancellation? Well, that also works to a certain degree, so you can cancel these features and they propagate cancellation to the rest. However, you do not have as much fine grade control as what you have with coroutines. So the coroutines kind of um, cancellation and structured concurrency mechanisms are more advanced and also much more battle tested than what you get with the current implementation of Loom. And that's not very surprising because they have to rely their implementation on thread interruption because Loom is on the thread level, so the only thing they can do is use the interrupt interruption mechanisms if they do not want to add new stuff. And this is not what they want because they want to stay back as compatible. So this is the constraint Loom uh, lives in. So when it comes to cancellation, brings excluding things from cancellation, which might be very important when you write frameworks, really, that might be very important. These are things you some I have to work around with some other, maybe not very um, beautiful mechanism. Then the last thing, which is this context propagation we've seen. And there, I personally really doubt whether this is such a good idea. It's also the youngest chap, so I hope it will change in the future. So what we've seen with, Co with Kotlin is that even so, for instance, I have thread local state, I can propagate the coroutines, I get automatic propagation of context through my coroutines. This is a very yeah, extreme powerful feature that coroutines offer you. In Loom, they realize that, well, we also need actually something like that, but if we would introduce a context, we would break a lot of APIs. So let's invent something new, like the so-called scope values. And how you do this then is, uh, you declare such a scope variable, then you say where, pass it in, pass the value, and from then on, you could read this scope um, variable in all the processes you spawn in this particular block here. Which you might imagine is not really compatible with the way frameworks are set up by now. Most of them really make heavy use of thread locals and just kind of say, no, now we do something else, probably gonna give a lot of headache to kind of incorporate it in our uh, standard way of doing. So it's not a pluggable approach. Everything within the Lambda will have access to the variable, and that's it. So it's a very um, uh, explicit way of giving access to scope variables, not like thread locals. If you liked it or not, uh, still they're apparently very powerful. So what you would have to do then uh, with scope values, if you have a transaction scope, security scope, this is what you have to, would have to put in those scope values. So we will see how this will turn out. But this is definitely a, a minor thing when it comes to the full-fledged experience with search concurrency and Loom. So it's okay-ish, but it's not as feature-rich as with coroutines. How about interop with async frameworks? Well, um, for the ones that raised the hands that I do reactive programming, uh, there is bad news in a sense. If it uh, concerns single values, this is what, value, what monos are about, or completable future, or the unis, or all the different abstractions you have out there, well, this stuff simply becomes obsolete. You can put it in a waste bin. It even just has a lot of complexity which doesn't add any value. You would use, most probably, things like that. So writing your logic more sequentially, a bit like coroutines do, the complexity you have introduced here just doesn't serve anything anymore. You have a counterpart that is simpler to be used. 
Well, but that's not the whole story, because when we look at reactive programming, we're also dealing with reactive streams. And there is a bit more involved than only threading with reactive streams, because we also have things like back pressure, which are not um, available with the simple reactive construct like mono complete of suits that we've seen. And there, the news is that, well, Loom is on the thread level. They don't come up with a new abstraction for these, so you have to rely on the reactive stream abstractions that are out there, which means for uh, Spring Boot, this would be a reactor, this would be Quarkus, this would be Vertex Micronaut, so you have to rely on these. The good story for Kotlin developers is that Kotlin already has a, a reactive abstraction for uh, these kind of uh, reactive streams, which is flow, which is a much simpler abstraction than these. And the nice thing is that you easily can convert any of these abstractions to a flow, a bit similar like you could convert a mono to a coroutine. So for Kotlin users, this is uh, th the thing you have to learn once, and then you can use it everywhere in a simpler way. So definitely go uh, good news for the ones who are using Kotlin. So interop with reactive async frameworks, also not really a perfect story. Okay, so then let's draw our conclusion. What we see is that they both have lightweight threads. Um, Loom is definitely better with synchronous logic that is executed asynchronously because it's available everywhere. Intrusiveness, Loom is definitely the winner because coroutines are to a certain extent intrusive. And when it comes to the last two, I would say coroutines are definitely the winner. So this is when you put these things next to each other. But I think what's more interesting is to look at the case where we would integrate Loom with coroutines or even Kotlin, because then I think you really get the sweet spot. Let's figure that out. To recap, if you're a child developer and you want to use these more advanced features of Loom, as I said, it's an incubator, but more or less it will probably look like that. Then this is what you get. So you can all of a sudden call again blocking APIs because they don't hurt you anymore. They won't block a, a real threat. Um, you can use some search concurrency with the search task scope, which said is a bit of brittle um, abstraction. If you forget to call .join, you get runtime errors. It's okay, but you, you probably can work around that somehow or ensure that in a test it gets tested. And of course, because it's Java, you have to deal with these exceptions, which you most probably simply rethrow, right? This is just the, the, the daily practice we get. But nevertheless, our um, concurrent program model is getting simpler, even so we do a bit more advanced stuff than just normal um, thread per request handling. If you do the exact same code with Kotlin, so no coroutines, just Kotlin, you get the advantage of a language feature which has a fancy name called function literal with receiver. These, these are so-called code blocks, as you can see here. Because you have these features, you can it make much more bearable to use Loom than in Java. Said so this exact same code. The only thing I did is adding this bit of glue code here. This is the only code that is needed to make this look like coroutines even. So if you're a coroutine user, then it would be easy way to switch. So you can make this experience better. Having said that, we've seen that Loom isn't, at least especially the newer chaps, are not perfect. We have this touch to task scope that doesn't work well with these contexts. That's something that, that's still not really, um, really solved. So we have uh, no thread local support. You can use scope values, but they don't work together with uh, other stuff. You can propagate thread local yourself if you want. Good luck doing that. It gets very ugly code. And you also seen that short concurrency, fine grade control of concurrency is not as well established in these two chaps as with Kotlin coroutines. But hey, we've seen that a thread and a virtual thread from the outside they're just the same. It's the same thing, right? So why not let a virtual thread execute a coroutine? That just works. And this is where I think you really get a tremendous benefit. So simply let a virtual thread execute the coroutines, then you can enjoy all this um, context propagation. We now can use our blocking APIs without the need for having this dispatch.io and the like. We can use uh, async await, so using um, parallelism in a very accessible and easy to read way. And what's more, uh, what's more is that this stuff you can use in production in Q4, because the only thing we need a virtual thread. We don't need these structural concurrency, we don't need the other chaps. Virtual threads, which become final, are good enough to accomplish that. So that's uh, kind of nice. 
which actually I would say is that coroutines will be completed with loom. So the suspend are no longer intrusive because I now actually could call a suspend method from normal method because the underlying thread wouldn't block. So this run blocking is not evil anymore. No more need for this dispatch IO where we really get errors, same like with reactive toolkits and all the other advantages up to that you can use flow for reactive streams, which is also much simpler than the other reactive toolkits. So this is coroutines and this would be coroutines with Loom. So the conclusion of my talk would be that, well, Loom will definitely not make coroutines obsolete. Uh, or coroutines anyway can't be obsolete because on Android and also Kotlin native, this is the standard way of doing um, concurrent programming. So they definitely will not get out of, um, definitely be removed from Kotlin. But for backend development, that's what you're focusing here. Coroutines definitely could be a real winning team together with Loom. I even think if you look at all the examples that Kotlin might profit most from Loom because it has coroutines, which has additional features. It has these language sheets to make Moon more bearable. So this is uh, what I promise. Um, for Kotlin, the future is bright. Even so for Java, especially if you use these thread per request ar uh, architectures, you also have just performance improvement without doing anything except for upgrading a GVM. That's of course also an awesome thing. So it's for both languages, it's, it's a big um, improvement. Okay, so we have five minutes left. Um, what can you do with this knowledge now, right? Certain chaps are still an incubator, they're not yet the final. It still takes some while till the end of the year. Maybe you have to make a decision today on a framework. You have to choose. The way I address this is actually with uh, quite a simple chart. The first question I always ask myself is, do I really need high throughput? Uh, do I need a framework that supports high throughput and parallelism? Do I really need that? Is this a business driver to have it? If I have Java and the answer is no, and I, I assume that really in many cases it's no, because we, we don't always write these um, highly available, high throughput, perfectly performing applications. Then I say, just stay with your blocking model. That's good enough. It's much simpler. And once Loom, or at least virtual threads, arrive at the end of the year, you get your boost yourself. So don't uh, kind of make it more complex than that. Otherwise, at least with Java, you will have to use a reactive stack. Knowing that one structure and currency would be there, you get a simpler model. I mean, you can keep up your reactive stack, that's up to you, but the structure and currency model should be considered simpler, more accessible to a wider range of developers than only the hardcore specialists, like maybe you are. When it, uh, when it comes to Kotlin, the same here. If your blocking model does the job, use your blocking model. It's simpler. You get the same boost with Loom. Otherwise, I definitely would always opt for coroutines because we've seen that Loom will complete coroutines. And also today, it is a much simpler programming model um, compared to, for instance, a reactive stack like Reactor. Uh, in other words, if you use Kotlin, just if you have to make a decision now, don't use reactive stack. Don't do that. You will just make your life unnecessarily hard, unless you like that, but I do not assume that. Okay, so um, I guess that was it. <laughs> we have two minutes left for questions, so...